Hello, everyone. So today we're going to take what we've learned from linear combinations of atomic orbitals and use this to build up a little bit more of a complete method of looking at the molecular orbitals. So we're going to be building up what's commonly known as molecular orbital theory, uh, which is one of the most common ways of trying to describe the electronic structure of an entire molecule. So a lot of these concepts will be fairly familiar, either from Gen Chem or as we've been building them up over the last couple weeks. So the basic idea of MO theory is that I'm going to generate a set of atomic orbitals. Uh, I'm gonna take my set of atomic orbitals, use them to build up a set of molecular orbitals. And knowing the energy of each of these sets of molecular orbitals, it's then going to be possible uh, to try and fill them up using essentially hijacking off-bow. So again, the idea of off-bow, we start with the low energy orbitals and we fill them up as we go progressively high until we run out. So here's going to be the trick. When we're starting with MO theory, first thing we have to do is build up our set of molecular orbitals. By convention, we're going to do what we've just done with LCAO, which is I take my atomic orbitals, I shake them up, I'm going to get a set of bonding and antibonding orbitals. Watch out, your book loves using the Girard, Ungerard uh, nomenclature for bonding and antibonding. So, a lot of, once we uh, we're going to go into a little bit more detail later about how to get the exact energies of these orbitals because right now we're just focusing on pretty big picture. Then once I have uh, the shape and energy of each of these orbitals as constructed from my original starting set, I'm going to use Pauli principle. So start with the lowest energy uh, orbital, throw two electrons, go up, throw in two more electrons, go up, throw in two more, so on and so forth until I run out of orbitals or until I run out of electrons because that will always happen before I run out of orbitals. But then here comes the fun question. What happens if I've got say two electrons and two orbitals? For that, we're falling back on our good old friend, Hun. So we're gonna make use of our Hun's rules which state that we're going to preferentially uh, occu singly occupy degenerate orbitals rather than doubly occupying one of the single orbitals. And don't forget our second rule, when I've got two degenerate orbitals and two electrons, or two de uh, three degenerate orbitals and two electrons, which will happen occasionally, the lowest energy is gonna be the one that has parallel spins. So all the electrons pointing in the same direction. And again, don't forget, this is all due to spin pairing energy, we want to keep those electrons as far away from each other as possible. So this is going to be the general procedure of uh, MO theory. The devil, however, as always, lies in the details. So we're going to take this basic idea, which, as you'll notice, looks a lot like our atomic system, and now build, uh, use it to build on top of what we've already done with LCAO. So in order to get a good appreciation for this, let's start with a simple uh, molecular system. So we already did uh, hydrogen molecule ion. Let's finally throw in that second electron and let's build up the hydrogen molecule. So good old friend, H2. So got two electrons, but in general, my molecular orbitals shouldn't differ that much from the single electron variant. So I can use this as a starting point. So I can take my two hydrogen 1s orbitals, mix them up. I'm going to get a sigma and a uh, sigma star. So uh, sigma G and sigma U, Gerard, Ungerard, bonding, antibonding. We now have way too many nomenclature variants. And the bonding orbital goes down, and the antibonding orbital goes up in energy, usually a little bit more than the bonding goes down. However, it is worth noting that when I throw in this second electron, the actual shape of the orbitals won't change that much based on the nuclear electron interaction, 
all I've essentially done is added in an extra electron repulsion term. So the general trends of how much the uh, orbital energies vary won't change too much. It's going to be some real nuance in the detail, which we'll again talk about later. But so far, we can more or less stick with our classic hydrogen ion orbitals because they're going to be qualitatively very good. So when I do this, I'm going to need to fill up my orbitals. So I know I've got one, two orbitals in, two orbitals out, one low in energy, one high. So if I've got a hydrogen molecule, this means I've got two electrons. So I'm going to throw two electrons in here, follow off bow. I'm going to ignore everything on the side and focus just on my orbitals and treat it like it's an atomic system. So in this case, I've got two electrons, so they're going to go in the lower energy orbital. And so this means they're in the bonding orbital. And because I've run out of electrons, nobody goes into the antibonding. Now, it's worth noting that this will result in my H2 molecule having a net lower energy because each of these electrons started out here. Each of them lowered in energy, meaning that this is going to be a favorable formation of a net bonding molecule meaning that this bound species is going to be lower in energy or more favorable than having two independent hydrogen atoms. Now, what turns out is that the exact difference in between my original starting orbital energies and my ending molecular orbital energies is going to dictate my bond energy. Because when I'm doing a bond disassociation, I'm starting here, I'm going up here, breaking apart. So, if you have, figure out the energy it requires to move two electrons from the MO to the AO, you'll have a rough idea of the BDE. Mind you, we will have neglected some of the electron, electron interactions. Most notably, you'd have to account for the spin pairing energy, which can be a little, uh, a little bit tricky. But in general, you can use this general approach, especially if you have the energies, to determine a lot about the behavior of a hydrogen molecule. Now, it's worth noting that you can also extend this idea to molecular ions. So if we want to go back to our good old friend, the hydrogen uh, my molecule cation, I remove an electron. I have one electron in here. And what you're going to notice is that the BDE will actually change. And it's not so much because the energy of my MO changes, it's gonna be much more driven by the fact that I have one less electron, which means that I've practically halved the energy it takes to disassociate this molecule. On the other side, if I say wanted to look at H2 minus, so I throw in an extra electron, which you'll note is going to be much harder because this means I put an extra electron up here. Now, when that happens, I've, hit, I've uh, hit this molecule with a serious energy penalty because I took a, uh, an electron that was sitting here relatively happy and then it had to go way up in energy. So this was going to cancel out a large portion of the stabilization that I got from these two electrons going down. So this is often a case as I throw in an extra electron, you have to watch out to make sure you're not overly populating the antibonding orbitals. Because especially remember, the antibonding orbitals tend to be higher up in energy than the bonding orbitals are down. So this is going to be especially a tricky scenario. Uh, so this also helps indicate the H2, if I've got two hydrogen atoms, and any choice of electrons, this will be the most stable because you're going to lower the BDE either by adding or removing an electron. So talking about adding electrons, let's try and work to a little bit more complex molecule. Let's go to a helium dimer. So yes, we are making a molecule out of helium. You do not see this, let's talk about why. So one of the simplest ways I can talk about trying to treat a helium dimer is essentially taking my original hydrogen orbitals and adding two extra electrons. So qualitatively, this is actually a pretty good picture. Quantitatively, this will start to break down because I've introduced a lot more electron electronic uh, behavior, which is gonna seriously modify my molecular orbital energies. 
Not to mention, I just changed the Z. So what's gonna happen a little bit more is less changing the shape of these MOs, though it will, but more the fact that I changed the energy of my actual atomic orbitals, which is gonna play a significantly large role in the numerical process. But qualitatively, nothing's really gonna change. One orbital goes down, one orbital goes up. The exact uh, numerical difference, we're not concerned with that quite so much now. We'll talk about it a little bit later. But what's important to note is that if I just treat this as more or less a hydrogen, uh, qualitatively as a hydrogen molecule that I added two extra electrons, because it turns out two heliums have a net total of four electrons, so those two extra electrons have to go somewhere, it turns out that they're going straight to this antibonding orbital. And again, this antibonding orbital is going to significantly raise the energy of the system because, again, the antibonding orbitals tend to be higher in energy, then the bonding orbitals are lower in energy, which means that my net molecule is not going to be quite so favored. So, turns out that it's going to, for helium, actually be lower in energy. For each of these electrons to say, nah, I don't want to be in an MO, I'm going to jump straight back to my normal atomic orbitals. And when you do that, congratulations, you just broke your system. Because if they, your electrons would rather be in the original atomic orbitals than the molecular orbitals you created for them, this indicates bond disassociation. So in other words, for this system, bond disassociation is going to be a negative value. Essentially, you're gonna get energy out of disassociating this bond instead of having to put energy in to disassociate it. And this is an important thing that uh, MO theory, even in this very qualitative form, can offer, is what it does a very good job about, uh, about is telling us if I have a certain set of nuclei and I have a certain number of electrons, relatively how stable are the bonds? Am I filling my antibonding orbitals a little too much? Am I filling a lot of bonding orbitals? And you can have plenty of cases that, unlike this system, are somewhere in between. And this especially happens as we move on to the second row elements. So let's, uh, so next time we're gonna talk a little bit more about those and introduce the wonder of p orbitals and some actual atoms you care about. So until next time, take care and stay healthy.